Hello, and welcome to the Cancer Moonshot White House Cancer Cabinet Community Conversation, Moving on Equity, OCE Expands Diversity Initiative. Welcome. We appreciate you joining us today and hope that you will enjoy this next hour to learn more about what's happening at the Oncology Center of Excellence, or lovingly, as we call it, the OCE. We're part of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and I am Rhea Blakey, your moderator for today. I'm also the Associate Director for External Outreach and Engagement at OCE. Uh, this is the first in a new series of coordinated Cancer Cabinet Community Conversations revolving around President Joseph Biden's Cancer Moonshot Initiative. I will gladly introduce our panelists in just a moment, but first, some words of welcome uh, from our host, Dr. Richard Pazder, who is also the center director of the FDA Oncology Center of Excellence. Oh, thank you, Rhea. This is a great pleasure. Uh, as Rhea pointed out, we've been holding conversations on cancer for many years, and this is the first that we're doing in conjunction, in conjunction with Cancer Moonshot on, under the auspices of that program. Uh, so we're really very happy to work with our partners in government in producing and conducting this conversation. Uh, Equity and project equity has been a major focus of the Oncology Center of Excellence. And uh, I'm very happy that we've convened this uh, group of stakeholders really to participate in the discussion of how to promote uh, equity, the representation of underrepresented ethnic and racial minority groups in cancer clinical trials. Uh, and I hope that this will be a very productive uh, conversation. Uh, we will be discussing about a recent guidance uh, that has come out of uh, the OCE on this entire issue of promoting uh, equity and uh, a a better distribution and representation, I should say, of uh, underrepresented groups in ethnic uh, in clinical trials. So we're very interested in hearing people's perspectives on this, and I think we have a great group of people representing many facets of our stakeholder community. So I'll turn this back to Ria, and we could proceed with the program. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, without further ado, uh, the person who truly did push this guidance, uh, draft guidance through on behalf of the Oncology Center of Excellence, Dr. Lola Fashona Jay, who is the Associate Director of Science and Policy to Address Disparities at OCE. And if you wouldn't mind, Dr. Fashona Jay, a little bit of background on the draft guidance. Yes, hi, good morning. It's such a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to, to host uh, this roundtable conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Ria. Uh, I want to uh, preface our discussion today by giving a little bit of an overview of this guidance that we're discussing. So the guidance uh, in, in question is a diversity plans to improve enrollment of participants from underrepresented racial and ethnic populations in clinical trials. Um, this uh, guidance is an agency-wide guidance that uh, covers um, uh, all medical products uh, regulated by FDA uh, across the three centers that regulate uh, medical products. So that's the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, and CDRH, our devices um, center. And this guidance really provides a framework uh, for sponsors to develop a uh, strategy to enroll um, racial and ethnic uh, minorities into clinical trials that we review at the FDA. It is not meant to be prescriptive of specific strategies that uh, companies should uh, implement, but rather really gives uh, kind of a bare bones uh, uh, framework for developing such a strategy. And we encourage that it be developed very early in clinical development. Um, as early as those uh, dose finding and um, uh, for, for drugs and biologics, as early as those dose finding and um, activity estimating trials all, of, all the way through the pivotal trial. And um, we really view this as an issue that needs to be incorporated and thought about in a prospective and detailed fashion uh, throughout the whole entire course of drug development. So we're very, very interested in hearing what our stakeholders have to say about how this guidance um, uh, will be implemented in their respective uh, institutions, uh, where areas of overlap and expansion uh, with regard to their ongoing activities or any additional areas for each of us to consider as we try to promote more equity in clinical research and in clinical drug development. Thank you. 
Thank you. I will briefly uh, introduce our panelists and then we'll get right into the discussion. So in alphabetical order, uh, Sandra Amaro, thank you for joining us today, Senior Director, Global Clinical Trials Diversity Team at Pfizer. Also, Dr. Marcia Cruz Correa, who is a professor of medicine at the University of Puerto Rico and has many other jobs, including being the lead of gastrointestinal oncology at the UPR Cancer Center. Uh, welcome also to Dr. Servan Georgiou, who is the Vice President of Clinical Sciences and Head of Clinical Late Oncology, AstraZeneca. Welcome. Hello to Mema Carmo. Good to see you again. She's the founder and CEO of Tiger Lily Foundation. Uh, also, welcome to Dr. Warda McCaskill-Stevens, who is the Chief Community Oncology and Prevention, uh, Prevention uh, Expert on the Trials Research Group at NIH NCI. Welcome. Dr. Ruben A. Mesa, the Executive Director of Mays Cancer Center at the University of Texas Health San Antonio MD Anderson. Also, Dr. Brian Rivers, who's the Director of Cancer Health Equity Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine. And Susan Shinagawa, who is a cancer survivor and advocate and also a community health activist, uh, who's also served as the past president of the Intercultural Cancer Council. Welcome to one and all. I believe we'd love to start with our patients because OCE is patient centric. Uh, we believe in a regulatory process that is collaborative and innovative, and we believe our patients are the experts. So if you don't mind, uh, I'll go by first names. We've, we've already confirmed that that will be allowable, permissible. Uh, would you mind, Mema, uh, leading us off because you've been in the game for a while. Uh, you've seen a lot of uh, other patients who participated in clinical trials and maybe had some challenges in participating in clinical trials. And based on the guidance that Lola referenced, uh, how, how do you see that being a step in the right direction, if at all? Well, thanks for having me here today, Ria. Um, when I saw the, guide, the guidance, I literally, I got very emotional in a, in a good way. Um, I am a 16 year breast cancer survivor, had triple negative breast cancer. And until three years ago, there was no treatment targeting my type of breast cancer. So imagine other women like me who are black and brown who get diagnoses and have no targeted treatment. This is what we live with for many, many years. And I've seen countless friends die because of the mere fact of not being offered a trial. For one, um, being offered a trial but not having the um, infrastructure to get them to support the access to and adherence to a trial. And then there's trust issues as well. There's, there's structural issues like work, leaving your job, your kids, the daycare, then there's cultural issues around, you know, black and brown people and our trusting of the past and why things happen. So there's things that have happened that are systemically with racism and things that happen that, that still make us afraid of trials. And so I feel like this is a really big step in the right direction. Um, I didn't know that I would get to be to see the day where this would happen, where we make um, we would be accountable to having stakeholders and sponsors and CROs be accountable to making kind of these kind of changes. So I'm very, very, very thrilled. I think too, as we do make these changes, we have to account for the emotional toll that um, not being asked, not being offered, not having the right structure has had on black and brown people. So there'll have to be, as we rule the guidelines out, a need for addressing our emotional, psychosocial, and trust issues around you know, being involved in tr clinical trials. Excellent, thank you. And Susan, uh, obviously equity comes in many shapes, forms, and fashions. Uh, what about cultural issues and generational factors from your perspective? Sure. Well, I'm going to talk about from my perspective, because that's what I know best of the Asian American community. Um, we are the fastest growing uh, population in the United States percentage wise over the past 30 years. And so uh, it's important that we we consider Asian populations. Uh, unfortunately, we are just a very minute uh, percentage of the number of patients that are involved in clinical trials. In fact, research focused on Asian Americans. Uh, the funding for that uh, through uh, NIH is 0.17% of 1%. So there's very little focus on that. Um, in terms of culture, there are a lot of cultural barriers, but the most important one for Asian communities is language and language access. And that's because 66% of Asian populations are, are immigrants. 31% are limited English proficient, 75% speak another language other than English in the home. And so um, Asians also tend to hold on to their culture and um, therefore they kind of isolate themselves from the mainstream and Main Street USA. So uh, I think it's very important in terms of language access when there are 
you know, well over 1,500 Asian languages and dialects spoken globally. In the United States, about 200 languages and dialects spoken, uh, Asian dialects and languages spoken. And of the top 10 languages in the United States, five of them are Asian languages. So uh, I think it's very important that we need to address this. It's obviously an extremely challenging issue. I think the most important way of getting participation into clinical trials is by working through communities. And when you talked about um, in the, in the uh, guidance, when it talks about uh, starting these, the planning for all, all the recruitment, everything early, they need to include community groups early in the planning as well, because without access to community groups, you're very unlikely to get participation of clinical trials participants from the Asian American community. Dr. Fashiona Jay, did you want to comment about that, given that you probably have the deepest connection to the draft guidance? Well, we agreed on first name, so just Lola. Okay. Um, um, <laughs> I, I think those are really excellent points that Susan and Mima made. And I think, you know, it would be, I have so many follow-up questions, but I want to switch over and maybe bring in uh, Brian or Ruben uh, to sort of talk about this issue around, um, you know, a heterogeneous population, right? Um, and the fact that in, even though we have these categories of race and ethnicity, uh, you can't assume that everybody is the same and that everybody needs the same approach to be um, uh, encouraged to participate in the clinical trial. So I don't know who wants to go first. Uh, maybe Ruben, you want to go because you, I know you. There you go. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, uh, a great pleasure to be here today. And thanks for the question, Lola. So the Mays Cancer Center that I direct is in San Antonio and our community is South Texas. So almost 5 million individuals, you know, of, of which 69% are Latino. So first we have learned that there's tremendous heterogeneity even within our disparate groups. Even as we think about Latinos, folks like Marsha and I, there are individuals with Mexican heritage, individuals with indigenous blood. There's different races, both white and black and uh, other cultures without question. There are individuals from uh, the uh, uh, island communities of Latinos and others. And all of these are critical factors. You know, that both race and ethnicity, as well as the spread of details kind of between us, have potential importance. Uh, for example, there have been found instances where, again, even amongst Latina women, uh, Latina women that have indigenous origins may have different sensitivity to breast cancer than Latinas who do not have that really genetic heritage of I indigenous uh, uh, blood and uh, family background. So there's tremendous importance. So as we've tried to evolve to really first try to capture this data really through mutually exclusive categories as one critical piece. You know, we cannot really be put necessarily into one bucket or the other, but to try to have really much more granularity to really help to separate both differences in race and ethnicity, as well as try to capture other, you know, try to uh, allow individuals that again have, you know, a more complex story to be able to share that in terms of feedback. And where possible, where we delve deeper into one population, such as in Latinos, to really try to be able to subcategorize that as well. Because we know that there's some very important differences. Someone who is from Mexico ancestrally versus from two years ago. Someone who is from Puerto Rico or, or Cuba might be very different than someone who is from Bolivia. So I think there's a lot of importance in the granularity in uh, all of the different community, communities that we speak of. Just as Susan shared, I mean, the tremendous genetic and cultural diversity across Asian is, is enormous. And all of that really enriches our, our science uh, enriches what we learn, but it's important to try to capture as much of that as we can. That's and, a great uh, point. And I think, it's, uh, let me just quickly follow up by saying that, I, you know, I think it's important for the audience that's listening to understand that, you know, we don't view race as necessarily a biological factor here, right? We view that it's a, I think we all agree that it's a sociopolitical construct and that when we think about race and ethnicity in the context of diversity, the aim really is to be able to enrich the study population 
for all of the factors that may impact outcomes, whether they be biological factors, whether they be social determinants of health. And so this is just one tool and one step, one issue to address among many issues to address. So I just wanted to emphasize that and, and also emphasize the fact that, you know, this guidance is focusing on race and ethnicity, and we know that people are defined in many, many different ways. Uh, this guidance specifically focuses on this group because we really wanted to put attention to this, but it's part of many other uh, efforts across the agency and across the Oncology Center of Excellence to address demographic subgroups. But Brian, I want to bring you in and hear what you think. Sure. And, um, and good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you to uh, Rhea for facilitating, moderating this panel. And thank you, Lola, uh, for the invitation. And, you know, similar to the comments that have been made thus far, um, you know, I'm at Morehouse School of Medicine located in the southern United States um, of, of America um, in the state of Georgia. And our principal catchment area um, are African Americans or Black individuals. And clearly, we um, acknowledge and accept the fact that there is tremendous heterogeneity, even within African Americans or Black individuals, um, whether their original points of origin are um, aspects from uh, different countries in Africa or even throughout the Caribbean. Um, but, but, but even so, um, those that have been here um, through multiple generations, um, we also see you know, not only this unique heterogeneity that exists, um, but then we also see this um, role and impact of social determinants um, on African-Americans. And I think that was really pronounced in, um, during this uh, pandemic that we found ourselves in for the past couple of years um, that necessitates some really novel and innovative strategies. Uh, we know African-American and Blacks continuously um, are disproportionately impacted by cancer. Um, and, and as suggested by epidemiological data, attenuating to the fact that Blacks have the highest cancer-related mortality from any of the major cancer types in this country. And the question begs itself in terms of why, what are we not doing? Um, what strategies can we put forth and, and what changes can we make? And I think the first step is realizing that there is this you know, biological heterogeneity that we have not uncovered yet. And that really necessitates a unique and different out of the box thinking. We cannot continue on, I think, in addressing cancer, especially among populations that are just being devastated by cancer, that don't even have, you know, the right options as relates to treatment, as relates to prevention and early other uh, prevention strategies. And, and so realizing that there's this biological heterogeneity that exists, um, there's been several studies that have suggested the existence of this biological Logical heterogeneity, and it is refreshing to see these, um, you know, the plan come out that really helps guide us in terms of better understanding. Yes, race and ethnicity is a social construct, but it has biological implications in terms of how one is treated and how one has um, different levels of access in society, whether that's through healthcare or whether that's through security related to um, various aspects of social determinants of health, which are extremely important toward health outcomes, inclusive of housing acquisition, job acquisition. And again, these are all risk factors for um, one's um, so, uh, you know, acquisition of um, COVID-19. And we saw that play out in a real way here in the state of Georgia. So, you know, again, I really um, agree with the, uh, the need to uh, really tailor and target our approaches um, within these different subgroups and not treat populations as if they're monolithic, but treat them and respect them in the regards that they should be. I think actually, uh... Marcia Cruz Correa may have had a comment uh, earlier. Did you did you want to weigh in? Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, thank you, Ria, and again, um, Lola and everyone for this opportunity. So I, I am at the University of Puerto Rico uh, and I am a gastroenterologist. And I, I've seen through many years how putting all the Hispanics in one box really is a disservice. And, I'm, and, and I just heard Susan mentioning the same from Asians, right? And, and the same applies for, you know, across different um, racial um, groups, uh, including the African-American community. Uh, when, you, when you think about communities, you also have to take into account immigration. So, you know, the patterns that are associated with this first generation, second generation, and to put this in the context of this extraordinary guidelines, and again, congratulations um, to Lola and Dr. Pazwer for really pushing this forward and Ria. Uh, it's really to, to make us very cognizant and, and help uh, the industry uh, when they develop drugs, uh, that when a drug is going from the beginning, right, preclinical, clinical and all the phases, we really need to think about the disease and the patients that we're going to treat with that drug.
benchmark. And in doing so, then organizing our preclinical models, organizing and understanding, you know, what are those um, specific um, changes, molecular changes that we see in a particular ethnic or racial um, group needs to be taken into account. So that then as the study moves to the clinical phase, then we design studies, taking into account the population that eventually will be receiving this drug. And you know, when you think about the Hispanic community and the same thing happens in many other communities, there are barriers that are huge. Literacy, it's still a barrier. And I'm not talking only about the Spanish language or the Asian language, but I'm also talking about the comprehension. And sometimes, you know, the, the type of um, consents that we received are really not for, you know, an, an eighth grade level or 12th grade level, really are, are more for, you know, professionals. So how do you explain this to someone from the community without that information? So there has to be an advocacy that to get the minorities, to get the diverse population that will eventually benefit from this drug or agent, we need to modify the way that we understand before we get the, the cancer, right? It's preclinical, this tumor heterogeneity, and after when we're doing the clinical studies. So Spanish, Asian, literacy. And then I, I want to also mention that there's also a an area that sometimes we neglect to, to think about. And it's the financial burden that our communities that are, are really affected with. So you, you need to, we need to be cognizant about that and really build trials in communities so that patients that are taking care of those communities that we really want to impact are involved. So that requires infrastructure, that requires multiple layers, right? Uh, that we can talk about that later. But, but it's important to keep in mind that just because we want to include a diverse population, uh, just the desire of doing that will not make it happen. We need to go to the right place and provide the right environment, which might include you know, help it even when someone has to take a day off to participate, you know, that's a day off that that person is not working. And that could have a huge impact in the family right, the family dynamics. So just wanted to weigh in on that. Thank you, Ria. Oh, thank you. Um, and actually, it. oh, go ahead. I love what she said. You know, it's so important that while we're doing this, the parts of these guidelines, I always think about the map, the importance of science and soul, right? We're discussing science, mm -hmm. regulation, guidelines, but there's a whole person's body that is a soul that's touched by cancer. Um, Brian mentioned the issues of people, you know, still dying at disproportionate amounts of cancer. If they can't trust their healthcare system, how will they trust clinical trials, right? It's just, you have to, you know, there's layers of problems. Um, furthermore, um, you know, how do we build a place where, or build a system whereby we have a systemic way of supporting patients throughout the trial process? Like I mentioned earlier, you know, if you have to be in a, you have people now who can't get to a trial, a, a treatment site on time or at all, or can leave their jobs with their kids or they're homeless. So how will we build a structure infrastructure that has money that's funded to ensure that we have the financial barriers covered, daycare barriers covered, insurance covered, the right to get to keep your job while in treatment covered. Those are all important points. I think we have to also have diverse patients as part of the plan. So when I first saw the guidelines, I was really, really happy. I was thrilled. I was emotional. I was happy. I was thrilled. All those good things. But I thought, why weren't my patients of color involved in the conversation? You know, I, as a tagalogically trained black patient in communities that have the highest breast cancer death rates in the country, can I have them be part of the conversation to be part of the guidelines? Whatever you build, you trust, you adhere to, and you follow up with. It's because you have ownership. So getting them involved in the beginning, building a structure, protecting them, making them feel safe. As black people, we don't feel safe in communities in general, regardless of health care, then health care and now trials. So that safety part is important. And last but not least, with our sponsors, you know, um, I love working with Pfizer and Sandy and her team. They listen to patients. They listen to patients. They lean in. They leverage what they've learned. And they love them through the process. And so how do we ensure that sponsors not, are not only accountable, but want to be accountable, want to lean in, listen, learn, and those solutions that are tangible, specific, measurable, and time-bound to make these things happen? Yeah. Sandy, it sounds like your cue. Yeah, I, I was going to say thanks, Nema, <laughs> for the, the cue there. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with the conversation that's already taken place. I think the beauty of the partnership that we've developed with the Tiger Lily Foundation, I think, is what we want to see in motion. And I think Mema hit it spot on. It's the accountability at a sponsor level. And so when we saw the guidance at Pfizer, 
What excited me the most about the guidance is that it's taking this from a conversation on why equity and inclusion is important in clinical research, because no one on this panel would debate that, and no one in the community would debate that, um, but it's taking it more from conversation into action. Right. So now as a sponsor, we're going to be held accountable for building in the conversation, internally shifting our culture within the industry to say this has to be built into our clinical development plans from the earliest stages. We need to hear the patient's voice. We need to then come up with a plan for the how. Right. So if we're going to build study level goals that represent what our recruitment should look like based on epidemiology and based on medical literature, setting those goals, but then also outlining what is our plan, right? Because you can talk about goals, but if you are not putting a plan in place for action, you will not hit them. If you are not putting investigator sites in communities of color, making it accessible, your goals are just numbers, right? So we have really looked at this guidance as an exciting time, which will really move us in the right direction, right? It's going to hold us all accountable at a sponsor industry level for us to do the right thing and stop. I don't wanna stop talking about this topic because it's so important, but we need to start moving because that's the only way we're gonna impact change. Survey. I would echo that, and I want to bring in Warta to the conversation as well. Warta, do you want to share your thoughts? Yes. Thank you so much, Lola and Bria. Um, I, I wanted to just share a couple of thoughts with you. Um, I lead the NCI Community Oncology Research Program, which is its community-based network that provides uh, clinical trials outside of the academic uh, institutions and a broad research uh, portfolio, including research on the delivery of care. And I think that's important. I think that um, I want to speak about access because um, you, that's really key. And this is what this program does. And as a matter of fact, a proportion, uh, 14 of the sites are selected specifically for race and ethnicity, having at least 30% of the populations be of that. And that includes safety net hospitals, uh, smaller clinics. So I, I think I, I wanted to... Um, speak from the perspective of what happens at the NCI and why I think the guidance is so important. Um, oncology care is not just the oncologist these days, and it's particularly important for those who are underrepresented, uh, those who bring to the table comorbidities. Um, so we need to have non-oncologists, we need the primary care physicians and, and other support for those who don't have primary care physicians, of course. But that's really important because your, the focus of the guidance is on the early phase trials, but ultimately you want to get them into the community for the patients who are getting treated for the specific disease diseases. And as we, we review those protocols across various research areas, all the issues of the eligibility, how do you co-manage those patients who come in with uh, hypertension or other cardiac diseases or obesity? Um, where these are patients who could be go on a clinical trial and may be excluded by eligibility, but with some co-management, I think can uh, can you know be worked through the trial. So that's really critical and important uh, for us. Teamwork is important. I think it's important to understand uh, how health systems are changing and, and what the chain is that, that actually approves the trials and how they look at the trials with the populations. We uniquely ask the sites to prospectively as they compete to participate in the program to really comprehensively look not only at the healthcare stakeholders, but the community stakeholders, you know, having the participatory advisors, but also having a very strong sense of what the referral pattern is going to be. Because as patients are educated about clinical trial or recruited to come into clinical trials, they need to bring their whole family with them. We all understand how important it is for the primary care physician to give that nod for the non-oncologist, for that patient who's seeking that trust, that sort of endorsement to come in. I think one other thing I'd like to just bring up that's so critically important that we've learned in the community, and particularly in the last couple of years, is the workforce. We all know that the workforce and having diversity is really, really important. And the key stakeholders, the research nurses, um, and that team are just critical, and, and we're losing. And I think we really need to pay attention and this impacts upon the early phase trials and the late phase trials and actually the follow-up. We need to make sure that there is diversity in the community to sustain, and particularly to sustain the support because our clinical trials are different. 
we're asking different questions. We're asking for biospecimens. We need to have those, those new workforce and trainings to understand the science, uh, how to communicate the science, not only to the patients, but that broader healthcare stakeholder community. Thank you, uh, Warta. That those are really some. You brought up some really fantastic points. I'm wondering if we can bring in Shervan to the conversation since he's uh, uh, hasn't I've had an opportunity. And, and I'm wondering if you can comment a little bit on, um, you know, given the discussion we've had thus far, what are you seeing in terms of, you know, how you would select or optimize the site selection uh, process within your company, for example to ensure that, you know, you have diverse representation in the clinical trial. And I'm thinking about that sort of site selection optimization from a domestic standpoint, but also in the context of global drug development, um, how you would bring in other regions or different considerations from a sponsor perspective to enroll that diverse population. Absolutely. And um, firstly, I, I would like to to echo what um, Sandy already said and to say from an AstraZeneca perspective, how much we welcome this uh, framework, this guidance, our commitment to take it a step even further. We discussed about introducing it early. We are discussing about introducing before even first time into human, because that's a point when we start to be able to collect PK, when we start developing the long term and not only at the end of phase two. And um, beyond that, also one aspect, if it's okay, Lola, to, to resonate with the aspect of trials being cost neutral to patients, and not only to patients per se, but to caregivers, childcare. You know, there are many patients for whom childcare is a problem, and being able, having that regulatory flexibility to address all those problems, I, I think it's critically important. And it was mentioned before, COVID, and I think with COVID we learn that the centralization can be so impactful also in terms of running clinical trials, in terms of difficult, cha challenging circumstances, but also maybe a half full where the centralization will allow us to access sites that maybe otherwise will not be easily accessible or patients that maybe will not be easily accessible. So those are a few of the things that uh, I wanted to say in addition to the question on, on trials. I think I want to be very clear, we aim to do a clinical trial anywhere there are patients and we have clinical trials frameworks that we would like to make sure that we execute on time, on budget. And I think very important, this being a discussion sponsored by FDA on quality, because we want to get the right mix between ensuring diversity and, and quality of the data. So what we do, we use a data-driven approach to identify the new sites and investigators. If needed, we will be prepared to support training of new investigators, as it was mentioned earlier, that patients coming from racial, ethnic minority, disenfranchised populations, they will connect and we will trust much better investigators from the same background. So support and training of investigators, I think is really important. Uh, I think in this aspect, probably I'd like to mention the pharma pilot, which is a joint effort of pharmaceutical industry in US. Going outside of uh, United States. Again, we apply the data approach, but also we will need to consider a number of other risk criteria, country situation, corruption, US embargoes, human development index, and bringing all together. And then also, to be honest, I would say that probably as we would like as an industry to expand and more and more and to understand diversity at the broader scale, will appreciate discussions with the FDA on how we'll ensure quality and acceptable auditing on, on all both sides. Can I just make a, a comment um, for, for the industry that is looking at doing, that does do global studies um, that you, you should not, I know there's a lot more Asians outside of the United States that are, that are in clinical trials. 
uh, for a number of different reasons, but you shouldn't assume that the results that you get on those patients are necessarily going to be applicable to Asian Americans. Just wanted to point that out. And I, I yeah, yeah. The... Rick, I wonder if you want to bring that, if you want to highlight this issue. Rick, you're on, you're on, uh... I, I wanted to jump. Can you hear me now? I believe you can. I'm going to jump in here and have Sandra and Serban comment on this from an industry perspective. And really, does industry have to rethink their site selection? And we take a look at, and we've done this, uh, of all of the multi-regional trials that have led to uh, drug approvals in oncology. Okay, And almost all of our uh, pivotal trials for drug approval are multi-regional trials expanding through many countries. What we see is a pretty much 20% come from the US, okay, which is not a lot, okay, uh, considering the size of our market. Uh, we sometimes see more people coming from selected Eastern European countries than come from the entire US, okay. So if we're going to have this conversation, and perhaps we need to have follow-up conversations with sponsors, because we're probably going to launch another project here on oncology, uh, is should we be taking a more careful look at how countries, or how companies, uh, especially global companies, select sites here? Uh, because here again, if we're committed to equity in the United States and re representation of underrepresented minorities, uh, do we have to have a further discussion on what is the percentage of patients that are coming from the United States? Here again, I have grave concerns when I see the distribution of these clinical sites and the accrual at sites where there's actually more sites uh, or more accrual coming from single Eastern European countries rather than uh, the entire United States. So do you think that this requires some uh, reanalysis or reconsideration on part of pharma? And I realize that there are many issues here, including um, speed, cost, IRBs, et cetera. But uh, do you think industry is ready to take this on? Sandra? Yeah, yeah. I, can, I can go oh, first. Um, so I, I do think it's, it's a conversation that has to take place. Um, when we think of diversity in the United States and the representation of patients and participants in the United States, that's really been, from a Pfizer perspective, our focus, right? Because we know what we're trying to address for, like the impact we're trying to make in the United States. I think when you start to think globally, the term diversity is different, right? And I think even the way we collect race and ethnicity isn't, it's not translatable outside of the US. And, and you could argue that even within the United States, it's not, it doesn't represent our full, very diverse yeah. nation that we live in. So I, I do think that there's further discussions that are needed for the global aspect of recruitment specifically within diverse patient populations. There's a lot of different considerations that we'll need to, you know, even just privacy considerations with the collection of data to that point. Um, but I do think we need to, to have the conversation, but in both cases on our side, it is to Sarban's point, a very data-driven approach, right? Where we are selecting and identifying investigator sites within the US and globally that can reach the intended population. So those that are impacted by the disease and we're taking it a step further with diversity to understand that site's catchment area. So the patient populations that they serve that have been historically underserved to the, up until this point. I guess, you know, one of my is yes. we're starting ahead, with only 20% of the entire enrollment of a trial. It's then very difficult to really get an adequate representation of the underrepresented groups here in the United States, because we're already kind of behind the eight ball here, so to speak. Right. It, it does seem, yeah, it does seem like a, a very small percentage. If you're, if we're truly looking to make an impact, it does look like a, that right. does sound like a small percentage. And maybe if, yeah, so if I was just going to quickly make a, a go ahead, Sharon, go ahead. No, I, I think I would like just to add a very quick point, which it, it's one thing that's really close to my heart, you know, is collaboration because the other uh, statistics that we can bring into this discussion 
is the relatively small percentage of patients, including from US, that are enrolled in clinical trials. And this is even more from racial, ethnic minorities and disenfranchised. And this is where I bring the concept of collaboration because discussions like this, and we will really welcome further discussions, you know, with all these case stakeholders, how we all can work together to be able to bring those patients into clinical trials, either if there are industry sponsored or academic sponsored, because there is a large pool of patients that I think not only they should, I think they almost, I would say they must be included in the clinical trials. And this is where the collaboration is coming. We do have hands raised. Yes, I, believe, I think, uh, I'm sorry, I believe Ruben had his hand up for a moment here and then Mayba. Wonderful. So I come at this issue really uh, from both directions. First, I've been the leader of multiple uh, ongoing phase three trials uh, around the world, as well as being a cancer center director for a minority majority community. You know, and I'd say that the conversation certainly begins with the diversity of sites, but that is just, I think, just one small piece. You know, at, at our center, we long ago developed the process of a minority accrual plan for each of our studies, recognizing even though we have a uh, Latino majority community, there are many issues as it relates to, to eligibility, the conduct of the study, and barriers in terms of social determinants of health that really required us to be very intentional in terms of trying to have the trial be representative of, of our population. Uh, I think there are, are many aspects that, that we need to focus on. I really applaud the, this move by the FDA to, to mandate a piece of this. Uh, I think it's critical. I don't think it happens by chance. And I think it really takes looking at the study really from a complete 360 standpoint. The number of sites is one thing, but you know, transportation is just one variable in terms of distance from a, a center that needs to be factored in. You know, there is patient navigation. There are clearly cultural issues. There is, as Marsha had said, there is language issues which are critical. You know, we found in our community, even the word trial for many represents the wrong image. Some of them think that it has to do with a legal process or, or the police and don't realize that, that again, that's, that's, not, that's not our intent. So I think diversification of sites is a start, but it really goes well beyond that. You know, and I like to think we go back to really, why do we want diversity on trials to begin with? And why, as Dr. Pazdra says, do we want trials to represent our population? First, it's good medicine. You know, we want our patients to be able to have access to the full set of options for cancer care. And clinical trials are an integral part of that. Because in, in each and every cancer, and it can be very granular, clinical trials can play a, a critical role at any number of stages in that process. But secondly, it truly is just good science. You know, if we primarily go to the path of least resistance or accrue in the populations most likely to accrue, there is just great ability for us to misjudge either efficacy and or toxicity. So I think it's about social justice, but I think it's about good science. Could I just add one thing? It's also about trust, okay? And I think that is a very important issue. We have are coming off of a, a extremely difficult time in our history here after COVID, where we can't say that there's economic barriers or lack of knowledge of COVID vaccinations in underrepresented communities. It's trust, okay? And unless we have, and we've heard this so repeatedly in all of our conversations that we have conducted here, we want to have people that look like us in these trials, basically, for trust. And here again, when we talk about aspect of access, we frequently concentrate on the financial issue, which is a very, very important part. But part of access is also trust. 
And we did see that so dramatically with both the COVID therapeutics as well as the vaccines, where they were free. There was no issue of cost. You could get them anywhere. They were giving them away in churches and everywhere. People just didn't want to get it because of trust. And one of the problems that we've had, unfortunately, over the past eight to 10 years that had been there long before, but brought out more dramatically is really kind of the politicalization or the 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 uh, po policies revolving and the controversy around various administrations here also, um, depending on where you stand in the political spectrum. Mema, I think you wanted to weigh in for a moment there. I did. I'm loving the conversation. I want this to last for like two, three hours. Um, but I have some thoughts I want to share. So I think it's so important as we're building these things, we build these guidelines and, and new regulations that those we want to serve are at the table, you know? So are we going to the communities to be able to say that we have these new guidelines and here's how this affects you as well? So not, a, not just having it be a guideline issue around, the, you know, FDA and sponsors and CROs, but how are we getting those who don't trust, who don't understand what the word trial means, what the word study subject means, what the words mean around clinical trials, right? What it means for them. But I think that talking about this is really important, but going to the communities and saying, you know, because they're going to say, why are you here? What do you want from us? You know, we want to take care of you. We want to love you and support you. So that going and saying, you know, we're here with you for a reason. I feel like also that, you know, no one should be missed by the clinical trial, this whole new process as well. Even though we have the new guidelines as well, we can't miss people. Is there a way to change the systems within the EHR to ensure that patients aren't missed and they are asked to be in clinical trials, um, number two? And be leaders as, we, as, you, as you guys work, to, as we work to, as partners to integrate equ equ equity into clinical trial systems. Um, I think also, you know, trials, I normally find they're at centers of excellence. So how do we build infrastructure communities that don't have the money and the funding and the resources of providers to be able to have trials in those communities where women and men live, work, play, and pray as well. Um, and lastly, um, how do we fund them to make sure that this works, right? Because we want to make sure that we have equitable access in the low community, community centers that are smaller and, and, and you know, more lowly, whatever the word is, as we have in the big center. So is there a way to build a bridge between the big centers and those that are smaller as well? Um, and lastly, you know, I really want to see patients as experts. So one of the things we're doing in Tiger Lily is training um, women of color to be not only angel advocates throughout the entire breast cancer process, <clears throat> but also to understand clinical trials. If you're a patient and you have breast cancer and you, uh, you're asked to be in a trial, your first thing is Dr. Google, <laughs> and then you're going to go to Facebook and then find advocacy. So how do we be a part of that process to build trust, transparency, and transformation as well? Mema, I want to thank you for shifting us into what is probably the final phase of this important hour, and that is with a phenomenal summation of all the questions that still have to be addressed going forward. So um, with that, we're going to count that as, as your particular closing comments, and I'm going to ask Brian to potentially shift gears if you weren't going to go there and, and consider um, some takeaways and things that you think are key to this conversation and moving things forward. You have the floor. Rhea, it's such a difficult task, but I do my best. So um, I really have enjoyed this conversation. I think there's been a lot of great nuggets, a lot of tidbits that have emerged in this conversation. And, and if I could just add, um, you know, I would strongly encourage us to think about um, equitable investment strategies. Um, representing the HBCUs and MSIs, along with Marcia Cruz Guerrero, my good colleague there, um, you know, we know the value of these institutions and the connections that they have to the communities that we're looking to serve. So I've been in the NCI designated cancer center on the faculty, been tenured and promoted for 10 years. And now I'm in the HBCU environment in close to 10 years now. So I have a great appreciation for the strengths of both institutions and realizing here at Morehouse School of Medicine, we are known for a social mission. We're number one in the country for our medical, as a medical school, known for a social mission, meaning this connectivity to the community. So currently we're putting forth strategies because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're the Southern US corridor of the United States. We're an hour and a half away from where the syphilis study took place at Tuskegee University. So there's this multi-generational effect that continues to erode that whole foundation of trust. And trust is a multi-dimensional construct. This trust of researcher, trust of the researchers, trust of the 
health care system, trust of the physician that's before me. And, and so we're working diligently toward this point to diversifying the workforce and expanding the workforce. So we're involved in, you know, ensuring that clinical trials, you know, um, look like the populations that they're looking to serve. So we're involved in the uh, Robert Wynn Career Development Award through BMSF and other initiatives that are taking place um, to really help address issues around trust and, you know, the trusting of health information that's disseminated into the communities. But then also, we're also looking at unusual suspects um, that could um, add a variety in terms of approach, um, in terms of how we engage. And that's one of the, you know, most appealing aspects of the guidance was the recommendation in category four on, you know, accent industry or other sponsors to describe how you're going to engage your participants, how are you going to ensure a diverse representation. And we're trying out models here. We're actually training clinical trial navigators that can work within clinical settings, but then also for those services that can be decentralized outside of clinical settings to assist with those. And then the clinical trial is an iteration of the patient navigation model. They have the core competencies to address financial toxicity, to offer some level of emotional instrumental support, to also offer logistical support. There's a lot of resources available to many patients, but you know, it's just this notion of navigating the connectivity to those different resources. And so um, putting forth sound strategies such as what we see reflected in the guidance, I think will really help raise the tide in terms of this conversation that we're having. If we attempt to do more of the same, we're going to get more of the same. But once we start thinking out of the box and to Serban's point, working collaboratively and investing in diverse um, you know, resources and entities such as a HBCU and leveraging the strength. We saw that happen during the pandemic. NIH stayed on our campus to help engage um, key participants in terms of vaccine distribution and helping address vaccine hesitancy, which is, you know, key here in the state of Georgia. And so, you know, again, thank you for the invitation. And I really appreciate this. I can talk on this topic for the next 20 hours, but I know we don't have time, so I'll stop there. We don't, thank but you we thank you. And we truly appreciate your comments. I know Marsha had her hand <laughs> up. And Sandra, if you wanted to go after Marsha, you're more than welcome. <laughs> thank you. Let me see. Yeah. So if I wanted to, I'm trying to put my, my head uh, around all the things that have been said. But I would say that we're all in agreement that there needs to be a change. This piece of policy, uh, this, this great uh, you know, summary uh, put together by the FDA, really it's another step in the right direction. The, there needs to be a change in what we're doing currently. And I think training, it's also a commonality. We're all agreeing that we need to train the diverse healthcare force from the nurses, physicians, navigators. So we're all in agreement. And there are models already that could help us do that. Models that have been sponsored by industry, also by the FDA, by professional organizations like the AACR and some others. And then I want to finalize this, this which, is, which we all agree as well. Patient-centric. Let's get the voice of the patient from the beginning, from the preclinical, all the way through the clinical process. We need to be cognizant of that. And we should have, I think we're doing some, but we could do much better. Patient in the center, because at the beginning and at the end, we start with the patient. That's why we develop drugs in cancer. Thank you. Thank you. Sandra, I didn't know if you had comments quickly. Yeah, sure. I don't know how I go after Brian and Marsha, um, but I, I think from a sponsor perspective, I think the thing that I will highlight and call out is the call to action, right? And the the need for all of us to lock arms and it's sponsors working together through pharma, with CROs, with our HBCUs. So, um, because there's not one organization or one sponsor that's gonna wholly fix this this problem that's been standing for years. So we really have, an, have the unique ability to really lock arms and work together to not only progress um, equity and inclusion in clinical research, but really we have, um, we should be growing our clinical workforce of the future and making sure that that is diverse. So partnering with HBCUs is one of the things that I think should be considered at a sponsor level. Um, so I guess my, my big takeaway is these conversations should not stop, but we should lock arms so that we can progress action together. Thank you, ma'am. Warda, you will be next and then Ruben, please. After so, uh, quickly, first of all, I just want to thank everyone and just really try to really reemphasize how important it is for us to understand 
what's happening in the early phase of the trials. It's critically important for our reviews. But, you know, patients and as, and, and as scientists are moving forward, they're asking, what information do you have on this population? And I want to say, even though we're focusing on racial and ethnicity, we really need to understand that one of the things we've learned from COVID is that we need to think about, you know, are we, which, are we looking at the younger population and Hispanics? You know, how do we use the new approaches as we relax things during COVID to, for example, consenting? So to begin to think about how do we do this in our early phase trials? You know, we asked some survey questions and it looks, looks like the flexibility of the remote consenting and other things that we did at the NCI were more applicable to the late phase trials and follow-up. But how are we going to use this new technology in in other patient populations? How are we going to get uh, elderly patients who are heavily burdened with cancer and need to be in the early phase trials so there's generalizability? How are we going to use these new approaches? So I think those are my comments and another push for workforce diversity. Thank you so much. Ruben. Wonderful. Well, it's been a great discussion. Let me pivot just slightly to say, you know, a, as excited as I am for us to see being able to offer uh, clinical trials for individuals with, you know, advanced disease or advanced cancer, you know, I think a crucial piece of this is how do we really use clinical trials to advance feasible cancer prevention and screening you know, for our populations, particularly, you know, those that face significant challenges for social determinants of health. You know, I see heartbreaking episodes, particularly during the pandemic, every day of individuals who present to the emergency room with advanced cancers who clearly either had symptoms uh, of cancer that they did not seek health care for for a variety of reasons, including access, employment, fear of, of immigration, uh, you know, regulations and things of that nature, you know, or individuals who missed screening because the feasibility of going for a colonoscopy, a mammography was just a bridge too far. So let's clearly advance as we're thinking about our traditional cancer therapeutic studies, but boy, how critical that we not forget that prevention and screening piece. Absolutely. Servant. Yes, very shortly from my perspective. Firstly, once again, to, to say this guidance document is a true key milestone in making progress into this critical area. From an AstraZeneca perspective, I want to be very clear. We believe that the patients enrolled in our trials should mirror the characteristics of disease populations. Collaboration, I think it's, it's my mantra today, and probably you heard it multiple times. I think we just need to come together because there are the issues are so multifaceted none of us will be able to resolve it on our own and also i will make a plea for all our working together to enable to sort out and progress all our enablers of clinical trial diversity including decentralization and other aspects that maybe don't fit perfectly but they are really strong enablers and we're really looking forward to future discussions on this topic. Thank you Thank so much. You. We do too. Uh, Lola, I want to make sure that you get some last words in here in the last couple of minutes, because uh, again, the guidance was really a work of love from your vantage point. So uh, final comments? Yes, I just want to take this opportunity to thank everybody for really being so, um, for sharing, being so candid uh, and sharing all of your thoughts on, the, on this important topic. I think that we have a uh, well-defined uh, charge uh, for us to undertake. And I think we have some uh, really very specific ways for us to move forward. I think we have a good uh, sense of the what, which is that there are a lot of inequities uh, in drug development and clinical research, um, structural issues, um, social determinants of health, other issues um, that are critical to address. I think we we have our why. Uh, Ruben was very... Uh, really provided a really good description of the reason why we're doing all of this, uh, which is that, you know, it's good citizenship. It's a social justice issue. Um, it is also good science. And as Dr. Pazder added, it's also an issue regard trust. You know, we've heard from our patients that they really have more confidence in the treatments that we approve when people who look like them, who have the same disease characteristics as them, are evaluated in the clinical trial. 
I think we have a good a sense of the fact that diversity is not one thing. It's not just race or ethnicity, um, that people come, uh, belong to many different boxes that we choose to put them in, um, and that it's really important to consider the totality of the patient or the totality of the community as we move forward with implementing some of these measures. Um, and I think we heard really the importance of the collabor collaborative approach and the multidisciplinary approach uh, to addressing this issue. Uh, we heard a lot about the need to invest uh, not only financial resources, but also invest in training, uh, invest in collaboration and workforce development. Um, and engaging the patient who you know, really are raison d'etre. The reason we develop drugs is not just to run trials. We develop drugs to improve outcomes for patients. And so the more that we can uh, continue to develop these trials from a patient-centered approach, uh, the better we will be all fulfilling the mission uh, that I think we've all signed up to. So I just want to thank everybody, uh, including our FDA team, our IT team, our communications team, uh, who've done a tremendous job in pulling this together uh, as uh, we continue to have these discussions as part of the President's Moonshot Initiative. Uh, we're so grateful for your participation today. Thank you. Thank you all. We are at the hour. Let's do this again soon. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, audience, as well. Everyone take care. Bye-bye. Have a great day. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.